can ask almost anyone you know the question, who is the first woman to have made a solo flight around the world? Well, most people say Mary Earhart, forgetting that she disappeared. She was lost when she was making her attempt to fly around the world in 1937. She and her navigator, Fred Noonan, were never heard from again. But 27 years later, my sister became the first woman to make a solo flight around the world. She flew an 11-year-old single-engine Cessna, officially named the Spirit of Columbus, but it was always Charlie to her. She wrote a book about her adventures. It's been out of print for several years, and then we recently reprinted the book as everything that was in the original book that Jerry wrote and more because there's pictures and telegrams and letters and so forth that just add to the great book that it already was. When Jerry was seven years old, she had a chance to take a ride in a Ford Tri-Motor airplane. She was so excited and when the plane landed, she said to my parents, I'm going to be a pilot and I'm going to fly around the world. They laughed. My dad, I guess, patted her on the head and said, that's nice, dear. Well, my mother was a right, and so we knew that there would be some kind of a connection there in the background. Um, so we knew that there was a connection that Orville and Wilbur would be distant cousins of ours. Jerry was always fascinated with stories of Egypt, the camels, the caravans, the pyramids, and she knew that she wanted to travel the world and see these things. And she thought, well, the best way to see them would be to fly. As she was learning more about geography and her classmates were talking about what they were going to do when they grew up, she said, I'm going to be a pilot and I'm going to fly around the world and see all these countries. They usually laughed, but when she returned from her flight around the world, they, they were there with a sign that said, Welcome Home Jerry, class of 1943. She always felt like she was supposed to do something special. She didn't know what it was. Later she figured it out. It was to be a pilot who would make a solo flight around the world. She had never been a typical housewife. Her major at The Ohio State University was aeronautical engineering. At first, the boys in the class thought, why is she here? She's probably just here looking for her husband. But when she was getting 100s on all the exams and they weren't always getting that, those good grades, they finally realized that she was serious. Back in the 50s, she co-produced an educational TV program called Youth Has It Say. This was one of the forerunners of the programs you often see today, where high school students would get together and they would discuss the world events. This was presented by a Columbus uh, radio station in cooperation with the schools of the Central Ohio area. Throughout the years, several students from other countries would come to Columbus to learn more about the United States, and many of them stayed for sometimes weeks at a time at Jerry's home. So that became, really fueled even more her interest in other countries and other languages. And she liked to cook the foods that she would learn about from these college students who were visiting with her. For one evening, in December of 1962, as Jerry and her husband Russ were having dinner. She was complaining about how boring her life was. I mean, you fix breakfast, and then you have to clean it up, you fix lunch, and you start all over again. It takes a lot longer to fix dinner and do up the dishes than it ever does to eat it. And although she was a gourmet cook and loved doing this and taking care of her family, she just kept thinking that there should be something else ex more exciting out there also. So as she was telling Russ how bored she was with her life that night at dinner. Russ said, well, if you're so bored with your life, why don't you just get in our plane and fly around the world? She said, all right, I will. They stopped, they laughed, and they thought about it. Well, Amelia had tried, but no woman had successfully made a solo flight around the world. In fact, Amelia's flight wasn't even solo. She had a navigator. Well, somebody had to be first. Why not Jerry? At the time, they co-owned a plane with a friend of theirs, and she asked Hal if she could use the plane to fly around the world. And he said, sure, that's okay. He didn't really think she was serious, however, but he'd already given permission to use the plane. The rest is history. It took almost two years of planning 
to, to get everything in place for her to do the flight. She had to talk to the ambassadors from the other countries to get permission to fly over and to land in other countries. And all of this had to be arranged in advance. Uh, there were no overseas flight planning agencies at that time because military and uh, corporate planes and commercial planes were the only ones who were flying over the ocean. And but she had to have, of course, clearance, as I mentioned. Uh, Brigadier General Lassiter was very helpful with some suggestions and giving her some airport, some, some Air Force support. But she did most of the planning herself. At the time of the flight, Jerry had only logged 750 hours and had only flown for seven years. She received her instrument rating just before the trip. She made her first ever instrument approach with a visibility of only a quarter mile visibility, lower than what most airplanes, airlines fly in today. In order for the flight to be, there's my dad and my mother, she used a Rand McNally globe to do most of her general planning. In order for the flight to be an official record, the National Aeronautic Association, or NAA, had observers who would officially lie on the ground, look up, and say, she flew over me at this point, at this date, at this time. The three extra seats had to be removed from the airplane to make room for the huge metal tanks that would hold the gasoline that would be necessary for the long flights across the ocean. Like cars, planes have to be registered. To identify them, words instead of letters were used to avoid confusion. Charlie's ID was November 1538 Charlie or November 158C. The November indicates that the plane was registered in the United States. While making her plans, Jerry was featured in several newspaper articles about her intentions. But back in 1964, the press and society had no idea what to ask this silly woman who was going to get in a plane by herself and fly around the world. Forget the fact that she would be embarking on a very dangerous 23,206 mile flight, surrounded by 178 gallons of explosive gasoline. They were interested in what she would be wearing. When the uh, newspaper people interviewed her and they asked her what she would be wearing, she explained that there would not be room in the plane for a suitcase because the plane was being just full of fuel tanks. Actually, she flew a fuel tank with wings, but she had a small suitcase, not much bigger than this, and then a handbag. And that's all she would have the room for. So she explained that she would be wearing drip dry clothing that she could rinse out at night and put on the next day. This picture was taken of Jerry just before she left on her flight. I had just handed her a cup of warm coffee because she was shivering. Uh, under the blue coat, you could see the last part of the skirt there, she wore a blue skirt and jacket. I had just bought a new white drip dry blouse, so she wore that. Pearl necklace, frozen heels. She was going to look like a lady, and she did. Now, she did have a pair of lower heels that she wore when she was actually piloting the plane, but basically that's what she wore. A friend of mine recently asked, what is drip dries? And she said, well, drip dries, do, do you iron your clothes, Lisa? No, I said, they're drip dries. But back then, nothing really was drip dry, and you had to iron it if you wanted it to look good. So, but finally, the, uh, the Associated Press headline horrified her because at one point it said, Housewife Jerry Mock of Newark to circle the globe in drip dries. So I think they could think to talk to her about. About the same time, a pilot from California, Joan Miriam Smith, decided that she was going to make a solo flight around the world. Now, Joan had had a lot of experience flying. In fact, she was a flight instructor and she had a large tw a twin engine airplane that she was going to be flying in. This would certainly sound like it would be much simpler for her. And she heard about Jerry. So she hurried up her plans and announced her intentions. Because Jerry then heard about Joan, she had to 
hurry up and leave before she had actually planned to do so. This turned Jerry's flight into a race with Joe. Although mechanical problems eventually scuttled the flight for Joan, she finished several days later. Um, the two, for most of the flight, they were pretty much neck and neck, you could say. Therefore, Jerry did not have time to leisurely see the world as she had intended. Finally, at the last minute, Lloyds of London decided that, well, yes, they would insure her. They didn't really want to do it because they thought it was a very foolhardy idea and they didn't want to lose their money. But at last, Jerry in her little red and white Cessna 180 was ready to fly. She was 38 years old, married, and the mother of three. Russ's mother, a widow, stayed at the house to look after the kids. On March 19th, Jerry flew out of Port Columbus at 9.31 in the morning. A few minutes later, as she was still climbing to an altitude of 7,500 feet, she heard the tower controller, whose voice was being broadcast to all of us over on the ground. Well, I guess that's the last time we'll ever hear from her. The official name of the plane, as I mentioned, is the Spirit of Columbus. Along the 19 legs of her adventure, Jerry faced daily challenges that would test any pilot. On the first day, she was airborne very long before she realized that her long-range radio was not working. What should she do? Go home? She thought of her sponsors and the people who were counting on her. She also thought about that tower controller who said that's the last he'd hear from her. She was not going back to Columbus until she had finished her flight around the world. So she settled down to find Bermuda, which was 700 miles away. Landing in Bermuda apparently is always pretty stressful because it's always so windy and that day extra heavy gusts of wind whipped at the tail of her plane. On the ground, taxiing to the terminal building, she realized that the left brake wasn't holding, sending her into a series of 360 degree circles before finally getting it under control. New brake assemblies were supposed to have been mounted on Charlie prior to departure, but in the rush to keep up with Smith's early departure, they decided that send her off without the new brakes and they forgot to tell her. Well the weather in Bermuda was exceptionally bad at that time and over the Atlantic the storms were so bad that Jerry had to wait in Bermuda from the 19th to the 25th of March. Even the commercial flights were being grounded but at last she got to at least she got a chance to sit back and relax and do some sightseeing. Radio men there had a, uh, an opportunity then to work on the malfunctioning radio. In order to do that, they had to remove all of the gas tanks in order to get to the wiring. And as it turned out, the main wire to the antenna motor had been disconnected and taped off prior to her, her departure. The radio never would have worked in that manner. This led to the fact that there was obviously foul play. I think back to the day before she left on the flight. She knew then that there was sabotage also. Her husband, Russ, was just double checking all the controls while the plane was sitting on the ground the day before her departure. At one point he revved up the engine and oil started pouring out of the oil filter. Now they had put a brand new oil filter in the plane. When they checked, they found that somebody had removed that one and put in an old one that was just ready to blow up at any moment. If Russ had not checked it on the ground, had not wrapped up the motor that day. It would have happened when she was in the air and she would have died. It's hard to believe that anybody would go so far to sabotage a plane knowing that probably the pilot would die. There's no proof and at first Jerry wasn't saying anything about the sabotage but a couple of years ago she said well it's been 50 years now I think it's okay I can say the death of the sabotage. There were other forms of sabotage also. These were the two most dramatic and the most dangerous. Finally, on March 26th, Jerry had a window of opportunity when the storms had subsided a bit. A new storm was brewing, and so it was definitely time to leave Bermuda. The Cessna's cabin tanks were full of gas, and the plane weighed almost 3,400 pounds. 
a lot more than the 2,500 pounds for which it was normally licensed. Her ferry permit from the U.S. Federal Aviation Agency made the flight legal, but not necessarily safe. She had no way of dumping fuel, and if she were to take off and discover that a radio or something did not work, it would be dangerous to attempt a landing until several hours worth of fuel was burned off. Jerry was always very careful to check and double check each instrument. Finally, she announced at the tower that November 153 at Charlie was ready for takeoff on her 2,200 mile flight over water to Santa Maria in the Azores. Now, out about to the middle of the ocean, Jerry noticed that the plane seemed to be slowing up and she was losing altitude. After checking everything in the plane, she had a very frightening thought. She turned her flashlight beam on the strut of the plane right outside her door and found that an inch of ice was clinging to the leading strut of the plane. Undoubtedly, as much or more would also be on the wings. Cessna 180s had no de-icing equipment because they were not supposed to be flying in these icing conditions. She knew she had to climb to a higher altitude, but first she had to get clearance. She had just passed into Santa Maria's light information region, so she radioed them. Now there are a few places I'm going to read from Jerry's book because I want you to hear it in her words and I want you to picture yourself in that plane with her. Santa Maria, November 153A Charlie, over, a few seconds passed. I was ready to try again when finally an acknowledgement came over the loudspeaker. He must have been having a coffee break. November 153A Charlie, this is Santa Maria Radio, go ahead. Santa Maria, November 153A Charlie has ice, wing ice, requests clearance to climb to the flight level 110. I tried to speak slowly and distinctly so he could understand. November 153A Charlie, please repeat. Santa Maria, November 153A Charlie has ice, requests clearance to flight level 110. Repeat. ICE request flight level 110. November 153A Charlie, this is Santa Maria. I understand you have ICE and are requesting flight level 110. Is that affirmative? Affirmative, affirmative. 3A Charlie, please stand by one minute. I pushed in the throttle some more and swung the flashlight beam over the strut. Now the ice was thicker. How much? An inch? An inch and a half? How much ice could Charlie carry and still climb to 11,000 feet? At any rate, a lot of the fuel had been burned off, at least 400 pounds, and that should help to compensate for the weight of the ice. But ice also can change the shape of the airfoil and cause the airplane to become uncontrollable. But hurry, hurry, Santa Maria. The one minute I was supposed to stand by dragged into several. I picked up the mic. Santa Maria, Santa Maria, November 1538, Charlie request clearance to flight level 110. I have ice! 38, Charlie, this is Santa Maria, please stand by. Santa Maria, please hurry, I can't hold out or too much longer. Now I knew the controller was looking for checking planes, other planes that might be in that same area, flying at 11,000 feet, but surely he must know that my plane could not stay indefinitely at 9,000 feet with ice. And if he didn't give me a new clearance, the plane would start down at its own accord. I looked out at the struts again. There was at least twice as much ice as when I first saw it. If the controller didn't give me clearance soon, I would have to try to get above the clouds anyway, without permission, while the plane could still climb. And finally, the controller gave her the permission that she needed. Eventually, she was able to land safely in Santa Maria, where a large crowd of people greeted her. This was one of the most memorable stops of her trip. She visited the small church where in 1493, Christopher Columbus and his crew stopped to worship as they were returning home after discovering the West Indies. They didn't get to stay very long for the entire mass because their lookout sighted enemy ships and they hurried off to set sail for home. It didn't even take time to haul up the anchor, but chopped it free. Recently, recovered from the ocean, it is now on display. Santa Maria to Casablanca, March 28th. 
A little over 24 hours before landing, after landing, Jerry took off for Casablanca. Can we stop here because I remember something? Santa Maria to Casablanca, March 28th. A little over 24 hours after landing, Jerry took off for Casablanca. It would take her about five and a half hours. But after a couple of hours, she realized that the airspeed was beginning to drop, and she realized again that ice was building up on the struts. She immediately called for permission to change altitude, and again it took several minutes for the controller to give clearance for her to climb. She realized it was just routine to him, and he wasn't several hundred miles at sea. Casablanca, March 29th. She got a good night's sleep and intended to take off the next day early in the morning, but at that time, weather reports kept her grounded for another day. But it was Easter, so she had a chance to do some sightseeing and a relaxing day to see the city and be entertained. Every time Jerry landed, Russ would call. And every time he called, he urged her to hurry and take off. Again, quickly, you don't need that much rest. You can get by on a little bit of sleep because you can't let Joan catch you. Well, Joan never did. March 30th, Casablanca to Bone, Algeria. Jerry started on her flight to Bone after carefully consulting with the weather people. 900 miles away, she would be flying about six hours. After an eventful flight, she arrived. And getting the plane bedded down for the night, after getting the plane bedded down for the night, the one English-speaking person at the airport offered to drive Jerry to our hotel. But Jerry had no French money, and the man at the hotel wouldn't take the American money that she had and wouldn't take her a $10 American Express check. Well, the English-speaking man said that the banks were all closed, and if she didn't have French money, how was she going to pay for her room and her, her dinner? So finally, in conversation, he agreed that he would trade her some French money for American money. But he warned her, do not tell anyone, because it's against the law. If anybody found out that he had done this, he could be put in jail. Thank goodness things have changed. If the banks have been open, it would not have been a problem. But uh, they weren't. March 31st, Bone to Tripoli, 418 miles. Finally, her international flight plan and getting Charlie cleared to leave was always complicated. She attempted to file her flight plan to Cairo, but everyone insisted that first she should stop in Tripoli. She was assured that the sandstorms indicated at Tripoli were nothing to worry about. Jerry wasn't happy about any kind of sandstorms, never ever hearing of any good things. But finally she agreed to their plan to fly to Tripoli and was cleared for takeoff. After a short while, all traces of civilization below were replaced by the grim desolation of the Sahara. Every few minutes, Jerry scanned the Eastern Hotel to be sure that everything was running smoothly. While one check, she noticed that the antenna to the high-frequency radio had unreeled. The switch that controlled the electric antenna motor was by her left knee, and apparently when she was wiggling into the plane, she had accidentally kicked it. So she flipped the switch to reel in the antenna, and then forgot about it. As she flew along, she daydreamed about the camel caravan and, and the tribes of the nomadic Arabs, just relaxing and having a wonderful time with her daydreams. But suddenly, my reverie was broken. I caught a whiff of something burning. Quickly, the odor became stronger, the acrid odor of burning insulation. My brain raced. The motor to the high-frequency radio. I had forgotten to turn it off. My hand found the switch and turned off the motor that had been grinding away, trying to pull in a wire that was already taut. That motor, that burning antenna motor, was just inches from the big tank. The big tank, half filled with high-octane aviation gas and half filled with even more volatile fumes. The airplane could blow up at any second. Charlie and I would be scattered in little pieces over the Libyan desert. Nothing would ever be found. No one would ever know what had happened to us. Were there sparks behind the tank? Was the wire burning? Even if I had been able to move, there was no way to see behind the tank. How much heat could the aluminum tank absorb before the mixture of gas and fumes would blow? What should I do? What could I do? Panic is a wild thing that paralyzes the thinking part of the brain and stimulates involuntary reactions. I thought of crazy things. If I'd had a parachute, I probably would have jumped. 
I thought of landing with Cecil in the sand. That would have been sure a disaster. But I was too scared to realize that if the plane would go up in flames, it wouldn't wait till I was on the ground. A hard landing could trigger, trigger an explosion, or the tanks might rupture, pouring fuel over hot metal and turning the airplane into a deadly hell. Jerry thought of radioing for help and giving her position, but she didn't dare touch the switch to see if the trailing antenna would unwind, and without it, she couldn't be heard by anyone. Reason told her that the only thing to do would be to sit quietly and let the scorching metal cool. Praying, she tried to relax. Finally, the smell of burning wire and insulation went away. She thanked God for saving her from panic, which could have caused her to do something very stupid. It was a beautiful day again, visibility was good, and she was able to see Tripoli and make a smooth landing. She spent the night at the Libya Palace Hotel, next door to the King's Palace. April 1st, 1,090 miles, 7 hours, 10 minutes. Cairo was about 900 nautical miles or 7 flying miles from Tripoli. Jerry wanted to get there before dark, so she got up at 4.30 a.m., but there was always so much red tape before takeoff. Charlie had been fueled and everything seemed to be going smoothly for a change, but finally she found the immigration man and asked him to sign her visa so she could go to Cairo. He impatiently told her she, that he was busy, that it wasn't time for the next plane and she should come back later. She grabbed his arm, pointed to Charlie, insisting that her plane was ready. He finally understood what she had been trying to tell him. It was 8 o'clock when she finally climbed into the plane. When she pushed the starter button, nothing happened. A mechanic decided the problem was the starter sol solenoid. This happened to be the one spare part she had brought with her because it was tiny. But where was it? It could be, could be hidden in any one of the many little tiny corners in which small items could be squeezed. Again, everything had to be removed from the plane, but finally the solenoid was found and installed, and she was airborne and bound for Egypt. As she neared Cairo, Jerry called the tower, reported her position and her estimated time of arrival. A few minutes later, approach control called and asked if 38 Charlie had the airport in sight. This surprised her, not thinking that she could be that close to Cairo. At first, all she could see was desert, and then sure enough, there was the airport, dead ahead about 10 miles. Tower controller said that 38 Charlie should continue approach for runway 5. She was happy to hear a clear voice with an almost American sounding accent. She called the tower reporting that 38 Charlie was now downwind on runway 5. And again, the tower told her to continue her approach. She relaxed and tried to ignore the vague feeling that something wasn't quite right. And again, I want you to hear this in her words. The wheels of the plane touched down gently on the runway, just as the voice of the controller came through the loudspeaker. 3A Charlie, what is your position? 3A Charlie is on the ground! But even as I answered, I knew something was really wrong. Yes, something was definitely wrong. Things were happening so fast, I wasn't sure just what to do, but I saw a taxiway that turned off to the left and decided to get the plane off the runway while I figured out the situation. The tower controller and I called to each other as Charlie turned onto the taxiway. At the same second, three trucks full of soldiers careened from around a corner from another taxiway, raced toward me and slammed to a stop within inches of Charlie, blocking my way. Guns in hand, the soldiers leaped from the trucks and surrounded the airplane. They looked as if they went business, although no one actually pointed a gun at me. I guess I didn't seem like too dangerous an invader. One of them signaled to me to shut off the engine. I decided I'd better see what these men wanted and find out where I was. I shut down Charlie's engine and opened the door. The officer in charge said, in good English, he must have seen Charlie's American flag on his tail. Uh, Madam, you're not in Cairo. What do you mean I'm not in Cairo? I might have the wrong airport, but I knew I had the right city. Madam, you're not in Cairo, he repeated. Okay, if I'm not in Cairo, then where am I? Here, show me on this map. I shoved my radio chart in his face. This map had only one airport in this vicinity. 
I wasn't going to let these soldiers frighten me. Well, at least I wasn't going to let them know how scared I was. The officer refused to point out my position and pushed the map back at me. Come with me, madam. Turn your plane around. Follow me. I started the engine and with men hanging and pushing on both struts, turned the plane around. We made a strange looking procession of trucks, men and airplane as we slowly moved in the opposite direction. I was surrounded on all sides by soldiers. I suspected I'd been heading toward an area that they did not want me to see. I decided it would be wise to keep my eyes straight ahead until they told me to turn. When we reached an oriental looking squarish building, the men showed me where to park the airplane and I climbed out. Two of the soldiers sat down under the plane. Whether they were guarding Charlie for me or from me, I didn't know. But as soon as she was out of the plane and had a chance to talk, she tried to explain that it was important that she called Cairo Airport, that people were expecting her and they would be worried if she didn't arrive. The officer just kept on walking, ignoring her as if he didn't understand English. But Jerry needn't have worried. Cairo was already calling and explaining who she was and the tower men, her NAA observer, the press and large crowds of people were waiting. Everyone sat around, visited with her, offering her tea and cider. They were very pleasant. They would not tell her anything, but they asked all about where all she'd been and where all she was going to be going. Hours later, when it was quite dark, the commander announced, Okay, madam, now you may go to Cairo. When Jerry asked where she was and how to get to Cairo, the commander just told her to follow him. The men guarding the airplane were told to push Charlie down the taxiway to a dark runway. Finally, when the plane was placed to his satisfaction, he explained, Now, madam, you take off down this runway. It's the wrong runway, but you use this runway anyway. When you get into the air about a thousand feet, you will see lights to an airport on your left. Don't land. That's military. And on your right, you will see the lights to another airplane. That's Cairo. There you may land. After carefully pre flighting the plane, Jerry fastened her seatbelt, shook hands all around. They all smiled, and the commander invited her to hurry back. She assured them she had enjoyed her visit and would like to return, but with permission, she had landed on a secret military base. She found out later that actually, the Egyptians were fronting the base, but the Russians were there. And that's why she couldn't leave until dark. That's why she had to use the wrong one way. Because obviously they did not want her to know what was going on. At about a thousand feet, she saw Cairo, called the tower, made an approach for runway five again, and was cleared to land. It was two hours before the, all, all the necessary red tape was finished and she could leave the airport. The date was April 1st, she called this her April Fool's Day landing. April 2nd, she had a day to rest, do some sightseeing, and took a camel ride. Karan to Duran, April 3rd, 1,173 statute miles, 8 hours, 14 minutes. April 3rd, up at 3.30 in the morning to head to the airport. Everything went smoothly until Jerry came to the immigration man. When he found she had no airline ticket, he refused to stamp her passport to leave. He just said, Lady, go get a ticket. When she didn't go, he got very cross. Lady, get out of here. I am busy. Go buy a ticket. Finally, she was, with the help of an English speaking man, she was able to convince him that Charlie did not need a ticket and she was able to take off. After she'd been flying for a while, Jerry noticed that some things were beginning to look a little fuzzy. Soon she began to realize that she had flown into one of the sandstorms that she had been worried about. Eventually, the swirling sands did settle down, but not till she was within a half hour of Duran. As she neared the Duran airport, Jerry gave a little sigh of relief that she had made it across Arabia without even a pop shop from one of those nomads who look like the little target practice when a plane goes by. Later, she told her husband and he said, that's just because they knew it was a woman and they didn't want to waste the ammunition. Okay. Jerry decided that the Duran Airport must be the most beautiful one in the world with his marble-cobbed terminal. Several hundred white-robed men 
people were crowded on the broad steps of the terminal, waiting to see the first flying housewife to venture into this part of the world. As she climbed out of the plane, they saw from her blue skirt that she must truly really be a woman, and they set up a shop, shout and applauded. Apparently not much exciting happens around here. She was something unusual, and the men were curious. The only women there were American wives. From the time of the Prophet Mohammed, Arabian women until recently had been hidden from all but their immediate families. They may not see or be seen by the outside world. To show one's face was a great sin. For a woman to drive a car in Arabia was not only wanton, but permitted by, prohibited by law under penalty of her husband being put in jail. Even European and American wives could not drive there. So the men were puzzled. Probably they thought that, that nobody had thought to make a law that they couldn't drive an airplane. And they thought, well, this just can't be happening. Although they were interested in seeing Jerry, it was obvious they were waiting for the pilot to emerge from the plane. They would talk to her, then they would look at the plane. Talk to her, then they would look at the plane. And she realized they were waiting for the pilot. They thought she had a man hidden behind the gas tanks. Well, you can see in this picture, no, it was all gas tanks and one little seat. There was no way there could be a man in there. So finally, one of the men went over, looked in the plane, and saw what you can see in the picture here. There was no man! And this brought a re really rousing ovation. Jerry's NAA observer and his wife took charge of Jerry, got her settled in a hotel, etc. Duran to Karachi, Pakistan. April 4th, 1,063 miles. Flight time, 7 hours, 38 minutes. About an hour out of Karachi, an airline pilot, captain, called Jerry on the VHF radio. Karachi was requesting the name of her occupation. She thought it was a strange question, but answered, housewife. Karachi to Delhi, April 5th, 665 miles, flight time four and a half hours. Delhi was only 592 nautical miles away, and Jerry looked forward to a short, pleasant flight. Finally, after about six hours at the airport, notice the flight was taking four and a half hours. Six hours at the airport, though, just getting all the paperwork finished and the plane cast and ready to go. At, and this was typical in other countries. At Palam, she was met by the usual crowd of press, men, and officials. One of them had met Amelia Earhart when she landed in Delhi in 1937 on her attempt to fly around the world. Delhi to Calcutta, April 6, 817 miles, flight time five and a half hours. This flight from Delhi to Calcutta was short and easy. She had an interesting day of sightseeing and visiting with the Indian people. Calcutta to Bangkok, Thailand, April 7, 999 miles, flight time seven and a half hours. Again, up at 3.30 to get an early start. Jerry flew over the Bay of Bengal, the Burmese coast, and landed in Bangkok. It was extremely hot. Since she never knew for sure when she would arrive at a particular city, she couldn't make hotel reservations in advance. And on this day, the best hotels were all filled. She had to settle for a second-rate room. Her hotel, um, there was a shortage of water in Bangkok at this time, and there was no water at her hotel, and the air conditioning didn't work. She had a great dinner though, shark's fin soup and alabone stew. Her idea of a great meal in my aunt is not going to see. Bangkok to Manila, April 8th, 1,365 miles, 12 hours, 19 minutes. 3.30 wake up time again. She got off the ground about eight o'clock Bangkok time. The cloud cover was heavy, so she had to file an instrument flight plan. As Jerry flew over the airport in Saigon, the approach controller called to her and asked if she had had a man on board. She answered, negative, no man on board. His reply was, hmm, good luck. Jerry was flying along peacefully for about an hour and gradually became aware that Charlie's engine didn't sound right. It was running rough. Something was wrong. Suddenly, she knew what the trouble was, dirt. She remembered the stories that she'd heard about the desert sandstorms and what they did to engines. When Jerry turned the carburetor heat on, air from an alternate source could get to the engine, allowing it to run better. But this way, the engine used more fuel. 
This could get bad. She was terribly thirsty, but didn't dare drink the rest of the water in her flask. She might need it if she had to spend days floating around in a life raft. She said lots of prayers. Less than an hour later, she approached Le Bang and landed safely. A large crowd of people surrounded her, asking questions almost before she could get out of the plane. Then so my sister Barbara met her and took her to their home. Charlie's antenna motor was repaired and finally the brakes were replaced. Manila to Guam, April 11th, 1600 uh, miles, 11 hours, 39 minutes. Takeoff went smoothly after the usual amount of paperwork. The engine now sounded good and Jerry was anxious to explore the vast Pacific. She was heading home. This flight was uneventful and Jerry landed at 8.05 p.m. Guam time. Someone opened the door to the plane and a band started playing. An excited crowd greeted her with, Welcome back to the United States. Guam to Wake, April 12th, 1500 miles, 12 and a half hours. Another 3.30 wake up call. Everything went smoothly because she encountered a minimum of red tape. Her official takeoff time was 5.30 a.m. The weather was good and the long flight went smoothly. She made a good landing at Wake Island, which has a diameter of only 15 miles. A miss of one degree only would make her miss her mark by 30 miles. I think she did pretty good for a novice pilot. The airport was packed with several hundred people. She was greeted with cheers, hugs, and legs. Wake on on April 13th, Jerry got to sleep in and relax. This was her favorite place. Her takeoff time then was scheduled for 10.30 p.m. This leg would take about 16 hours, so she decided to fly at night and arrive in Honolulu while it was still daylight. As she taxied out to the end of the runway, Jerry couldn't help remembering the story that one of the men had told her. It's about a legendary shark named Mag Check Charlie, who was supposed to swim around Wake Island, living off the remains of unlucky aviators. According to the story, he is a very smart shark, and he has good ears. When a pilot would take the plane to the end of the runway to check the engine magnetors before takeoff, Mag Check Charlie listens very carefully to see if the engine sounds rough. If he detects a rough magneto or anything that seems unusual, he swims to the far end of the runway to bring it into his dinner. Now the men had been having a lot of fun, and they watched her expression very carefully as she answered, Well, Charlie has a smooth engine, and I'm not worried, but it's nice to know I won't be alone out there in the dark. When, Char <laughs> when Jerry had assured herself that the Cessna's engine was as smooth as she had claimed, she told ground control that 3-8 Charlie is ready for takeoff. Wake to Honolulu, 2,345 miles. Flight time, 15 hours, 46 minutes. Now remember, she's just sitting all by herself in this one seat in this little tiny airplane. She couldn't even get up and stand up and stretch or move around at all. Can you imagine sitting in a plane all that time? The night closed in and she was alone with her thoughts. As dawn came, Charlie raced to greet the morning. Honolulu was easy to find. Jerry called for and got Clarence to land. Another big crowd greeted her. And almost immediately, she was called to a phone. Now, notice the first picture on the left, how happy she is. The second picture, she's on the phone. She's not looking happy. It was Russ. He told her about all the luau's and parties that had been arranged for her and then canceled because he told the people she would be tired. She would need her rest. She would need a good night's sleep. She was furious. She said, but I'm not tired. Not now that I'm here. How could you have ruined things for me before I even got here? Someone from Cessna was scheduled to look after the plane and she was again told of all the parties and luau's that had been canceled at her husband's insistence. Everyone would respect her wishes and leave her alone. She was taken to a hotel where the desk clerk assured her she would not be disturbed. She ended up having dinner by herself. Honolulu to Oakland, April 14, 2,409 miles, 17 hours, 38 minutes. It was after 5 p.m. when she was finally ready to taxi out to the runway. 
Before leaving home, she had worried about flying all night, praying that she might fall asleep. She discovered, though, that excitement made it possible for her to do things that otherwise she couldn't have done. At home, she would sit in the living room and try to sit and stay awake for a long time, and always fall asleep. This was not an option when she was in that airplane. She had to stay awake. Oxygen helped her stay alert. At least once an hour, she would put on an oxygen mask for a period of 10 to 15 minutes. She got calls from ships, Air Force planes, and that helped to pass the time. When Oakland International Airport came in sight, Jerry had been flying almost 18 hours. But she didn't feel tired, just wonderful to be almost home. She touched down to an enormous throng of people. They seemed almost as excited as she was. Russ had flown to Oakland to meet her. A young girl introduced herself, explaining that she was entering a convent and had to give away all her worldly possessions. She gave Jerry her gold St. Christopher's medal to protect her from harm. Oakland to Tucson, April 16, 746 miles, five and a half hours. Took off to Tucson to refuel. It was good to be flying in America again. She spent that night in an airport hotel, leaving a wake-up call for 4.30. From Tucson, she flew on to El Paso, landing at 7.45. She had not been expecting anyone but her NAA observer, but as usual, there was a crowd of people. They had all kinds of things planned for her, but she couldn't stay. A storm front was moving across her path, and if she didn't hurry, she could be grounded for several days. This was not going to happen. Another quick refueling stop at Bowling Green, and Jerry Kellett for Columbus. More than 5,000 people awaited at the landing at Fort Columbus. Her family was there, of course, and Governor Rhodes, Mayor Sensenbrenner, Congressman Sam Devine, Air Force Generals, and the deputy of the Federal Aviation Agency with a telegram from President Johnson inviting Jerry to come to the White House. It was so exciting and ready to get it. Some of her classmates were there holding a sign, Welcome Home Jerry, class of 1943. Her friend, Mixie Heckelman, was one of the classmates. When she learned that I was doing talks about Jerry, she learned this airplane that her husband had made to me so that I could display this plan in my talks. And again, her plane was bigger than this, but it gives you an idea. It was a very tiny little airplane. And the thought that anybody would want to take this little plane and fly it across the ocean. I've talked to other pilots and they say, no way. Wouldn't even consider it. There I am sitting with my mom and dad. I was only 23 years old. Gee, seems like yesterday. Jerry never flew Charlie again. He besides, um, in the Advar Hazzy Center of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum at Dulles Airport. Jerry went on to do a lot more flying, setting 21 aviation records, many of which she still holds today. She had another plane, uh, Mike, that she used, where she set a lot of other records. She had several significant firsts. She was the first to fly solo around the world, the first, first woman, the first woman to fly the Pacific in a single engine, the first to fly the Pacific from west to east, the first to fly the Atlantic and the Pacific, and the first to fly the Pacific in both directions. These pictures were taken at Jerry's home the evening she returned. The one on the left was my grandfather Wright, my mother, Jerry with Molly Bowery on her lap, and I'm next to Jerry and my sister Barbara on the right end. And then the far right, of course, is Bowery with Grandfather White. It's his father who traces back to the right brothers. Jerry has received more than 100 awards and citations, including the one presented to her at the White House by President Johnson. Jerry is a true aviation pioneer. Her flight is considered more technically challenging than Lindbergh's and obviously more successful than Earhart's. May 4th, when she was at the White House, turned out to be Valerie's birthday. She was four years old that day. And so the White House people arranged for Valerie to get a birthday cake, which was presented to her own silver platter that was engraved. 
At a party at Jerry's home shortly after her flight, Brigadier General Strauss, commander of Lockbourne's 801st Air Division, made an amusing comparison of her exploits with the routine flights of the SAC bombers. Every week our, our planes fly the ocean, he said, then paused and added, with the help of three men and six engines. One of the men there at the party asked Jerry why she thought that she was able to be more successful than Amelia. Because, he said, Amelia flew a brand new twin-engine Lockheed airplane that had just been given to her. Jerry, you flew a single-engine Cessna that was 11 years old and had a paint job to cover the cracks. Amelia was a very well-seasoned pilot. She'd been flying for a long time. You were pretty much a beginner. Yes. Amelia even had a navigator. How do you explain your success over her failure? She said, well, I was smart enough not to take a man along to navigate. And it always gets a laugh. In a 1960s brochure entitled Ohio Gate Flight to the World with the listing of aviation firsts. The first listed, of course, was our cousins, Orville and Wilbur Wright. The last one in this brochure is my sister, Jerry. Some other greats were there, including astronauts John Glenn and Eddie Reckenbacher. She was in very good company. In 1970, Jerry was recognized as Columbus Citizen Journal Outstanding Woman of the Year. And in 1981, she was inducted into the Licking County Hall of Fame. Jerry was honored as one of 20 Outstanding Women in Ohio in 2013, and in 2014 she was honored by the State of Ohio along with Annie Oakley as a Great Ohio. Later when she was looking for other aviation records, she found that three Russian women had taken the international record for straight line distance from her hero, Amelia Earhart. So she set out to beat the Russians, which she did the best she could by flying. The record by the Russian women earned them the hero of the Soviet Union by Joseph Stalin. They flew 3672 miles in 26 hours, 29 minutes. So Jerry crushed their record on, from April 9th, 10th, 1966, flying 4,528 miles from Honolulu to Columbus bringing back the international record from straight line distance for a woman back to the United States. She landed at Fort Columbus fulfilling after only 31 hours in the air, non-stop. A couple of years later, on June, June 1968, she shattered another world record for women flying from Columbus to, to Puerto Rico and back in 33 hours without stopping. Jerry had said, Columbus is an air-minded city and I really hope I've accomplished these things. I really hope what I've accomplished will help aviation. She gave, she realized it was too expensive for her to keep Mike. So she, knowing about the flying padres, the priests who had territory of thousands of miles, she, she knew of one in New Guinea who needed a plane. So she donated the plane to him flying to Lay, New Guinea, off the coast of Australia. And doing that, just taking the plane there, she set nine aviation records. After she landed, Jerry stayed there for a month, working with Father Gandusa. They visited leper colonies and worked with underprivileged people, and she got to dance with reformed cannibals. She said this experience was life-changing for her. On September, finally, in more recent years, Jerry's getting the recognition that she should have had a long time ago. But you must keep in mind that at the time of her flight and her early records, the Vietnam was going on, President Kennedy had just been assassinated, and these things took over the headlines. And they pretty much forgot her. And Jerry wasn't one to toot her own horn. She did this flight because she wanted to do it. She wanted to have an adventure. There was something that she just wanted to do for a long time and did it, but not to be noticed by other people. But on September 14, 2013, a life-size statue of Jerry was unveiled in the courtyard of the works in Newark, Ohio. 
A similar statue of her was unveiled in Port Columbus Airport on April 17, 2014. This was the 50th anniversary of the completion of her flight. And on March 23, 2016, the permanent placement of her statue at the airport was unveiled along with a display of her accomplishments. Now I have here a maquette or a small statue similar to the one that is in Columbus at the airport. This will be on permanent display at our local museum, The Works, along with a model of her plane that my friend Don Lewis had made. I also have the clothes that Jerry wore on her flight and they are part of the display, uh, a copy of her book and of the memorabilia. Jerry passed away at her home in Florida on September 30th, 2014. Two weeks later, she was inducted into the Columbus Hall of Fame. Following Jerry's wishes, she was cremated and her ashes were spread by air over the Gulf of Mexico on April 20th, 2015. On December 17, 2015, Jerry was recognized into the First Flight Society at the Wright Brothers Memorial in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. We sent in a variety of pictures for the artist to choose one because they have a portrait of every inductee. And this is the one he chose, showing her spirit, as he said. And he added at the bottom, the world at the airplane. I thought he did a wonderful job. A lot of people wondered why did she fly a single engine airplane? Well, that's what they had. They co-owned this plane with their friend Al Almaster. Also a lightweight plane burns less fuel more efficiently, therefore less fuel is needed. She didn't need a navigator. She had very good equipment and she knew what she was doing. She really was probably a better flyer than Amelia. She didn't take chances. None of us in the family had any doubt that she would do it and succeed. Just never thought about it.